Good morning, everyone. My name is Todd Kimball, and I'll be your MC today. It's an honor to be with you this morning. We had some great co collaboration in the green room as we overcame some difficulties. Our technical director and president, Dave Danucci, and our videographer extraordinaire, Mr. Mike Perche, pulling things together to keep us right on schedule. Our reader this morning is the organizer of the readers, or as I like to refer to him, the Lord of the readers, Mr. Al Christians. Okay, thank you, Todd. Our reading today is a biographical recollection, is, is an extract of a biographical recollection by Arnold Sundegard. It's collected in this book by, um, by uh, Studs Terkel. And I think I see somebody's got my camera reversed there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Sundegard was a, a young drama a graduate of just a graduate drum graduate of drama school in 1936. And he's talked he talks to in what I'm going to read about working for the WPA during the later part of the of the uh, Great Depression. Susan Glassville, head of the Midwest Play Bureau, part of the Federal Theater, hired me to read two plays a day and report on them. Most were pretty bad, but the whole idea was to give writers hope. The Federal Theater was doing Eugene O'Neill's The Straw about a young man with tuberculosis. Susan said to me, why don't you do one on a contemporary problem that we don't know much about? She was referring to syphilis. She suggested the living newspaper as a form. It was an invention of the federal theater, a new way of speaking on the stage, a new form of journalism. We used everything, projection on screens, photographs, headlines, film clips, scrapbooks, charts, dance, and live actors, of course, always on important issues of the time. So I took on the job of doing a play on syphilis, a subject people shied away from. Spirochete, we called it, after the germ, and it was a medical history of the disease. At the time, the Surgeon General was having a mass blood testing in Chicago. Everybody was shocked by the idea. I went to all the research libraries in town, visited all the clinics. I remember visiting the county jail where they had a clinic. One shot in the rear in one week, one shot in the arm the next. They tested all the actors too. One old, old actor said, boy, oh great, it's great to get that over. It says positive. He didn't know that positive was bad. <laughs> Turned out that we he had to take treatment for it. To show the spread of syphilis in Europe, we projected a map with neon tubes running through it. Catherine Dunham's dance troupe was acting it out. It was terribly exciting. The tickets were 25 cents. It really grabbed the audience, really shook them up. They talked about it even after they left the theater. It made a lot of them aware, vocal and active. At one of our performances, a committee from the state legislature came down from Springfield to see it. They had been debating the passage of the premarital blood test. My play, Spirochete, I'm told, was instrumental in passing that bill. That's what the WPA was all about, to give people hope. Thank you, Al. Excellent reading today. Our speaker joins us live from the Friendly House this morning. Dr. Tony Biglin is a senior scientist at the Oregon Research Institute. ORI exemplifies humanist values and actions, helping communities overcome conflict by bringing people together around a shared vision of the qualities they want in their community. They help them create an action circle to promote these qualities throughout the community and to identify and address the most important concerns and problems. Dr. Biglin is the author of Reboot and Capitalism, How We Can Forge a Society That Works for Everyone. Let's have a rousing ovation from the Friendly House and a warm yet muted welcome from our Zoom audience for Dr. Tony Biglin. Okay, so there's a um, an old joke about a prison where everybody been in there so long that they knew all these jokes. And so they just uh, indexed them. So somebody would yell 22 and everyone would laugh, right? So in our family, 111 is technology is driving me crazy. So what I want to talk about is, I'm going to first talk about the state of the nation, which I don't think will surprise any of you, but I want to do a brief summary of the state of the nation. 
And then I'm gonna talk about health disparities and the role of social determinants. A lot of what I'm working on, I, I basically have retired from Oregon Research Institute. I'm still considered a senior scientist, but I created a, a, a nonprofit called Values to Action, uh, which is really trying to translate the things we've learned in the last 40 years about human behavior into actual change in actual communities. And in fact, I have a, a, a member of Values to Action, uh, Vincent Shirawami is here, and uh, you'll probably hear more about what we're doing together. But the, you know, after 40 years of doing randomized trials, showing the benefit of, of family and school and community interventions on all kinds of problems, reducing antisocial behavior, substance use, depression, academic failure, uh, you know, really a whole lot of things. But most of that didn't translate into actual changes in society. So, I, you know, I'm a former president of the Society for Prevention Research, which we created about 25 years ago. And it's, the, it's a well-kept secret that we have an enormous amount of knowledge about what we can do to prevent all of the kinds of psychological and behavioral problems that, that confront us but it's not being used. So what Values to Action is doing is trying to get that stuff actually in use. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. So what I was hoping to do was ask you to, to tell me what your vision is for, the, for your community. If this were the most wonderful community in Oregon, would you, what would people see here be, be, be doing and what would they feel? If you have a cell phone, you can, take a picture of that uh, QR code and it will take you to a website. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to show you what that will produce because of the technology. But anyway, this is a question that's based on, um, there's a program called the PAX Good Behavior Game that a friend of mine developed which is now in about 50,000 classrooms around the country. And in, the PACS Good Behavior Game, the first thing that they do is they ask the kids in elementary school classrooms, if this were the most wonderful classroom you could imagine being in, what would you see, hear, feel, and do more of? And that becomes the, the concept for how the kids are going to create their environment. So the kids participate in creating that. And it's the, the PACS Good Behavior Game is in hundreds of classrooms here in Oregon. And the beauty of it is that uh, it's, a, it's the foundation for all the things they do in the classroom to kids. Uh, what, what they call the things that kids wanna see more of is, is PACs, peace, health, happiness, and productivity. And the, or, the, organ, the, the classrooms are organized around that. So I'm asking you if you can, if you have a QR, access to a QR code, you can go to the website and you can tell us what people would see, hear, feel, and do. I'm collecting these. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. So if I can go on, okay, then I'm gonna go on. So I'm gonna talk about the state of the nation, health disparities, the nurture consilience and assisting communities in becoming more nurturing. So first, the state of the nation. Uh, this is a, uh, my book, uh, Rebooting Capitalism, you know, talks about all of this in considerable detail, but, um, First of all, we have the highest level of child poverty of virtually any economically developed country. And what you see here is, this is the per poverty rates among people over 65. And those started dropping around 1965. Anybody guess why? Medicare, it ended poverty among elderly people. And as you can see, the poverty rates among the elderly went down with that and social security but they've been stubbornly high for kids under the age of 18. So that's one of the problems we have in our society and poverty in, in youth is a, is a risk factor for virtually every academic uh, and social problem. And then there's uh, economic inequality. This is a graph of the relationship between the amount of inequality in terms of the relationship of the amount of money to the wealthy, the amount of money to the poor, um, and then this is an index of health and social problems. And if we stopped and made a list of all the things we think are problems, they're in that index, including premature death. And so what this shows is that 
countries that have low levels of economic inequality also have low levels of this index of health and social problems. Japan, Sweden, Norway, and Finland, they get to economic inequality or economic equality in two different ways. Uh, Japan never got, never adopted the practice of paying enormous amounts of money to the very wealthy. And so they have greater uh, 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 quality. But Finland, Norway, and Sweden, they tax the rich and they redistribute. So you can get there in two different ways. But either way you get there, you have low levels of all of these health and social problems. And guess what? USA, we're number one. We have the highest level of economic inequality of any, any country by far. And we have the highest level of all of these kinds of problems. So this is a huge problem. And the reason it seems to be the case is that if you live in an economically unequal society, you're just more likely to run up against people who are higher in the, uh, the society or lower in the society. And both of those cause tension. So, and that seems to be driving much of, of the problem. Um, then there's a book by Robert Putnam, a sociologist called Our Kids. And he published this maybe, maybe 10 years ago now. And he, he, he starts by taking you to his hometown, which is a small town on Lake uh, Erie uh, in Ohio. And um, he describes what it was like when he was there. And then he takes you back 50 years later. When he was there, people had pretty much equal amounts of money and poor people lived in neighborhoods with wealthy people. Maybe you were a bricklayer, but you lived next door to a lawyer. That kind of thing happened. And in fact, it happened when I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, the, there was a plumber on one side and a stockbroker on the other side. You know, people just lived that way and they knew each other. And so he describes, for example, there were only two black kids in his, his class. And one of them uh, was a woman, a, a girl, and she and her mother uh, cleaned the house of a wealthy person. And so one day the wealthy person asked her if she was going to go to where she was going to go to college. And she said, oh, I'm not going to college. And so, as Putnam put it, the woman puts on her furs and goes down to the principal and says, you've got to take send her to some schools and get to know those schools and make sure she gets into college. And in fact, she ended up in college. And as a re result, and she got a master's degree and she worked her entire uh, career in education. Putnam's point is that in a society where you are socially connected with other people, you know, you live next door to a lawyer and you got a problem, they give you advice and so on. And, and that's, those are societies that work very well. And Putnam also published a book called Bowling Alone in America, where he described the decline of that kind of interconnection among people. Um, and so he uh, is, is making the point that we need that kind of thing. Fast forward 50 years later, and he comes back to his community, and there's a gated community with all of these wealthy people on the lake, and then there's highway, and there's a trailer park on the other side. He then proceeds to take you to, cut to communities all over the country, including Bend, Oregon, and shows you how these people are living and how those people are living, and it ain't pretty. Um, over the past 50 years, America has become far less nurturing of those who are poor. Economic inequality and poverty have increased greatly. Social mobility, the chance that a poor child will uh, get into the you know, upper ranges of society has basically disappeared in this country. And so, um, oh, and then there's unregulated marketing, one of my favorites. We, have, we do not have regulation of uh, uh, a business. And in fact, these are the, some of the strongest examples. 450,000 deaths a year due to the unregulated marketing of cigarettes, pharmaceuticals, 68,000 opioid overdoses, alcohol, 95,000 deaths a year associated with alcohol consumption, unhealthful food accounts for 678,000 uh, deaths. Uh, the, we have gotten to the point where for the first time in history, uh, the life expectancy of children is lower than the life expectancy of older people and uh, it's due to the marketing of unhealthful food. 
And the evidence on that is very clear. It's been clear for a number of years. Um, so let me give you a brief history of the evolution of capitalism in the United States. First of all, start in 1970. In 1970, there were bom 1,900 bombings of businesses. A huge proportion of especially young people hated business and didn't trust business and was acting in these radical ways. This uh, understandably uh, concerned the business community. Lewis Powell, who would soon be uh, appointed to the Supreme Court, was a lawyer and he had a neighbor who was the chair of the Chamber of Commerce uh, Education Committee. Powell wrote a memo in 1970, which has been widely credited with encouraging the development of an effort by business to look out for its interests. Because what Powell said is, it's no longer sufficient for you to simply have your company look out for your own interests. Business has to band together to look out for the interests of businesses per se. And what that led to, uh, with it's, he, he, it was a very uh, well thought out insightful memo. So he said, you've got to organ, organize and work together. And so they did, and they did it around a unifying theme, which was the invisible hand. How many are familiar with the invisible hand metaphor? Okay, yes, this is, this is an educated audience. Right? So uh, the invisible hand notion is that, and this is something from Adam Smith that said that in a marketplace, um, people are motivated to maximize their gain but because they're in busy trying to maximize their gain, they may do things to improve the products that you get or uh, to make them cheaper or better in some way. And so, and if you don't think that markets have those, that's those kinds of benefits, you should turn in your cell phone because I submit that this, these cell phones are the product of the competition among people in marketplaces to make a better product. So there's a lot of truth to that. But it is not inherently the case that if I simply pursue my economic well-being, it will necessarily benefit everyone. It's simply not the case. But that has been the theme that has been used to promote free market economics since 1970 and very successfully. And if you read a book like Dark Money by Jane Mayer, she documents the 50-year the, the effort of business and conservative interests to take control of the understanding you know, that the day comes when, uh, you know, uh, Clinton says the era of big business, uh, the era of big government is over, right? Even the Democrats embrace this. If you read the last chapter of Rebooting Capitalism, I'm as critical of the Democrats as the Republicans. So they forged a large network of organizations and the result was a diminution of our community values. There's a, been a, a sur survey done of incoming freshmen in colleges all across the country for 40 or, or more years. There is a graph of the percent of kids who said they wanna pursue materialistic values. I wanna be rich, I wanna be famous, or they wanted to contribute to the well being of others and care for others. Those two crossed in the early 70s as the advocacy for free market act, economics that there's now more kids going to school say, I wanna be rich, I wanna be famous. If I'm rich, it proves that I'm okay and I'm doing good things, right? Well, okay. And then I, I, I'm a, flan, a, a fan of selection by consequences. I would argue that not only is our behavior selected by consequences, but the actions of, of uh, companies, corporations, organizations are also selected by their consequences. So here's an example of selection by consequences. This is the percent of wealth of the top one-tenth of 1% one of uh, the country. And what you see is that about 1978, their share starts to increase and increase and increase. I, this chart only goes to 2013, but don't forget that there was also another big tax cut that greatly increased the wealth that the Trump put through. So this is this has continued to rise. And this these are the consequences that paid off people for, you know, they tried something to get a policy change. They got the policy change, they keep doing it. And so they got better and better at taking control of it. And they've taken control of, of, of the common understanding of the society. Okay, so this is a, a, a chart. There's a paper we're, we're just publishing uh, on this. 
where what we're interested in is disability and premature death. And to the credit of the National Institutes of Health, since George Floyd was murdered, they have very taken very seriously the need to increase research on how we can reduce health disparities. And so there's a lot of money coming to that. Uh, Vincent and I are busy figuring out how we can get some of that money to do research on how we can reduce these disparities. But in our paper, we argued that the, the greatest attention has been paid to, you know, what causes disability and premature death? Well, uh, tobacco uh, uh, use, dietary risk, alcohol, drug use, low physical activity. These are well-established risk factors for disability and premature death. And our concern has been that NIH is mostly focused on how we're going to change these. You know, you grew up in a, a bad neighborhood and you didn't learn to uh, develop your physical activity, and we're going to increase your physical activity. We're going to work with your family and, you know, do that. All good, you know, these things work, but they're insufficient because, oh, and also there are physiological process, stress processes that contribute to these. I'll say more about that later. But so, the, so now the interest has turned to the social determinants of health, poverty, discrimination, harmful marketing, toxic physical environments, diminished quality of schools and neighborhoods. These are risk factors for these kinds of things. Now, NIH is not a political entity because they got a lot of Republicans in the legislature. And so, you know, they're very careful about these things. But what we're arguing is that all of this can be understood in terms of the changes in public policy in the last 50 years. And if you do not change those public policies, we will not, we will have a limited impact on these problems and therefore a limited impact on those problems. So, and I'm, I'm happy to say that um, I've, we've gotten some attention from the leadership of National Institutes of Health on uh, these problems with this argument. Okay, so another, this, this is a study that just came out, public policy and premature death. They took, the, these folks, Montez et al, modeled the association between working age mortality rates and state policy. So this is people under 65 and their mortality rates. And how is that associated with public policy? And what they found was that more liberal policies on the environment, and by liberal, I mean things that progressives have put in place, on the environment, gun safety, labor, economic taxes, tobacco taxes, when those were uh, those uh, policies were in place in states, they were associated with lower mortality in in those states. Uh, unfortunately, conservative marijuana policies were also associated with lower mortality. But the point is, I mean, this is basically uh, the red states and the blue states, the red states don't have these policies, the blue states tend to have them, and they have lower mortality among people under the age of 65. There's also uh, a study that came out recently, the correlates of congressional districts with election deniers. Okay, so a congressional district and what proportion of the people in that congressional district are election deniers? You with me? Okay. So what they found was that the characteristics of the congressional districts that had election deniers was recent large increases in the non-white population in the district, low levels of education, loss of jobs, high levels of deaths of despair, and you will find that article in the New York Times at, at that link. And so once again, I, I mean, if you look at the what happened in Ohio and other states with NAFTA, the, the, the number of unemployed, you know, I mean, there are a lot of angry white people who you know, used to have fat affluence. We have hollowed out the middle class and those are many of the people who are, um, who are very angry and it's a problem and we need to work with everybody. Okay, so what we've, at Values to Action, what we've done is we've decided we really need to focus on communities. And part of the argument is that it seems like the federal government is going to have limited ability to, to address these problems with now the House of Representatives being able to block, uh, uh, you know, many of these kinds of things that we need. And so, um, and in addition, there are states that are in, absolutely in the control of conservative interests. Uh, even and have people voting against their own interests. Uh, there's a lot of that happening. 
But so we're in for years of conservative control of the federal government and government in many states. And if that happens, it'll be impossible to implement policies and programs that in, can increase the nurturance at the national level or in those states. And I, so I think we can evolve islands of nurturing communities. And that if we can show that at the community level, we can significantly increase the well being of people by helping to bring them together and do the things that are needed, that we can actually begin to be a model that spreads around the country uh, and hopefully around the world. And we have to include rural white communities in this effort as well. So, if, so I think that the, the, what, it, what our problems come down to is a fundamental choice between two kinds of values, a society in which our highest value is the enrichment of the individual, which has come to dominate public thinking for the last 50 years, versus a society in which we value the well-being of every person, the well-being of every person. That, to me, is the value that we need to promote. So, and I, and I would argue that science can't tell us what our values should be. Values are a choice. And you can't, you know, you can't say, there's, there's no way that the science will show that, that these are the right values. However, science can tell us what consequences of our chosen values will have for ourselves, for those around us, and for the society as a whole. And there's a lot of evidence on what, the, uh, what values orientations work well for people. Which brings me to the nurture consilience, and there are two papers cited here, and we'll, I can make all these slides available to you if you really want to dig into it. But um, consilience, uh, my wife says, uh, nobody would understand that word. You can't. But I actually had some people who do. Consilience simply means that all of these different groups have come together, uh, different areas of science, you know, philosophy, and so on, have come together and, and said, oh, this is what is the case. And I would argue, and I think on firm ground, that 50 years of biobehavioral research converges in showing that people thrive in nurturing environments. And in fact, I published a book in 2015 called The Nurture Effect, which summarizes much of this, and that's cited, and there's a, a, also a more recent paper. In these kinds of environments, people are happier, they live longer, and they have fewer conflicts and less violence. And so uh, the first thing that nurturing communities do is they minimize toxic biological and social conditions, toxic social, biological conditions like high levels of airborne lead or the consumption of a lot of omega-6 uh, omega in the diet. But it's also the social conditions that we, you have to minimize aversive social conditions, conditions in which when people are uh, chronically aversively treated, it increases the likelihood of their having physiological problems and, and premature death. And this is an example from a study that Greg Miller did, where basically they summarize the evidence showing that this kind of interaction with children produces epigenetic changes and post-translational modifications in tissue remodeling. I won't go into the details of this, but basically it puts a child on a trajectory to have physiological arousal uh, uh, and stress hormones that result in the development of obesity and, uh, and uh, ca ultimately cardiovascular disease. And so these kinds of social processes are not simply bad for, uh, you know, for the behavior of kids, they're bad for the physiology of kids. And, we, and, and this is one of the reasons that poverty is a risk factor for for poor uh, problems. Uh, in fact, there's a study that shows that um, people who are uh, living in poverty are significantly more likely to have um, numerous problems, except if they say that their mother was nurturing. If they say their mother was nurturing, that buffers them against the, the harm of all of these kinds of things. So we need nurturing parents. So another aspect of nurturing communities is that they ritually reinforce all kinds of pro-social behavior. And I'm not talking about M&Ms and, and stickers. I'm talking about listening and caring and hugging and cooperating and so on. And I have to say that if you haven't figured it out already, I'm a behaviorist. 
Now I have to stop and say two things about that. I, I was reading B.F. Skinner back in the 1970s and I was, you know, into getting into behaviorism. I hadn't, I, I had hated B.F. Skinner, but then I started reading it and realizing that, you know, this was actually pretty useful. So I, I mean, the number of years I've gone through a behaviorist, oh my God, you know, I'm a former president of the ACLU of Oregon. So I'm just telling you that eventually uh, I worked that out. And in fact, uh, realized that yes, we want the, the ACLU is interested in uh, protecting the well being of, of individuals and protecting them from government. And so um, I don't know why I got into that aside, but anyway, uh, well, it, it's it, because there's a humanist connection with all of this. I don't know if you know that B.F. Skinner got the hum, American Humanist uh, Award back way, way back and so on. Um, but anyway, we need to richly reinforce pro-social behavior uh, with you know, cooperation, kindness, learning, skill development. That's so important. And then we need to limit influences and opportunities for problem behavior. Influences like the harmful marketing that I talked about but also influences such as allowing kids to uh, associate with other kids who are getting into trouble and being unsupervised and so on. We need to prevent that from happening. And in fact, uh, uh, Vincent and I are working on how we can do that with, the, with his community, that the kids need to be monitored and involved in pro-social behavior. And if they are, you're gonna have far less of the kinds of problems we've been having in society. And so the last part is to promote psychological flexibility, which is a mindful way of pursuing our values. It's basically, uh, there's a, been a revolution in clinical psychology over the last 25 years where it's become clear that we can help people deal with a wide range of problems by helping them to be, willing, to be clear about their values and to focus on living their values even in the context of thoughts and feelings that say, oh, this couldn't work, or oh, I'm nobody and I'm no good and so on. And this is a, uh, it, it's just been amazing to see how helpful this is to people with all kinds of problems from anxiety to obesity to anger and so on. So we need to promote psychological flexibility, which is a mindful way of pursuing our values. So if you choose to pursue nurturance, then we need to get into the issue of promoting nurturance through a common vision. So um, that slide I showed you, I, I don't think I, I, it'll, I will send you what you put in and I think not too many people did it. So maybe we won't have much, but I've done this uh, with indigenous leaders in Canada. I've done it with uh, people in Sweden. I've done it in high schools in, in Eugene and, and I'll show you one more, but. This, these are the kinds of things people say when you say, if this were the most, best community, what you, would you see, hear, feel, and do? And look at what the kinds of things they come up with. Kindness and sharing and togetherness and language and commitment and volunteering and so on. And then here's uh, Newburgh, Oregon. How many of you have heard about the conflicts in Newburgh, Oregon around the school board where they fired the, uh, oh, okay. Uh, how am I doing on time? Well, okay. so. Um, Okay, so um, this is the word cloud that came out when we asked over a hundred people in Newburgh to say, what would you like your community to be about? And, and I did this in conjunction with uh, uh, Denise Bacon, who was a city councilor, uh, had been on the city council for, uh, for 14 years, but she was also a community organizer and she worked for the Ford Family Foundation on helping communities with these kinds of things. And I was introduced to her when somebody from the Ford Family Foundation learned that I was working in Yamhill County and, and said, oh, you should talk to her. And I thought, oh, okay. So I meet her in a coffee shop and I give her a copy of The Nurture Effect. And about three months later, I learned that she's created an organization called Nurture Newburgh. I love this woman, right? <laughs> so, we worked together. And then when the conflict started and the conservatives took over the school board, and, and I will tell you, and it, it, I mean, Denise, I'm not sure how to go through this. 
she died on October 21st and it, she died of an immune disorder. She was in the hospital for three weeks. I went last Sunday to a celebration of her life in Newburgh and there were a couple hundred people there. She touched so many people. What I love about this, this uh, thing is that the biggest word, the most people use that word was listening. And Denise was so good at listening and she listened to people and they trusted her, even though she disagreed with them and many things, they trusted her, they loved her. It was an outpouring. And I realized, you know, I had known Denise working on some of this stuff, but she's working with all these other people on all these things. I mean, it was just, a, it was just a beautiful thing. Talk about nurturing people. Denise was a nurturing person. I, what we were working on was that once we got to this, we were working on how we could increase the degree, the promotion of these values and throughout the community. And we were doing that by getting people to say, you know, um, I, I, uh, Vincent helped me uh, get my groceries uh, to the car. And I really appreciate it. just little things of all kinds and having people praise and recognize the things, but also praise and recognize the organizations that uh, were doing good things in the community. And what we're going to st still see if we can do is carry forward with that uh, by creating an action circle to work on these kinds of things. So um, I was hoping to present your values here, but I'm pretty sure I can't get to them. So I'm going to guess that um, you probably didn't have a lot of, you know, I want to see more anger in the community or I, I want to see people complaining to other people or, uh, you know, things of that sort. I'm pretty sure that's not the case because I've done this with so many different people. And when you ask them what they value, they value safety and caring and, and kindness and so on. And so the challenge we face is the, how well can we get that happening among all of the people? And I'll bet you, you know, if you can think of people, you know, oh, those people, what do they believe? And I can't, can't talk to them and so on. And that's one of the things we're working on is, no, no, that's not what we want to do. And one of the chapters in Rebooting Capitalism is on persuasion. And the research is very clear. If you disagree with someone and you think they're wrong, telling them that is absolutely worthless. If you, and if you're on social media and you don't like what somebody's saying on social media, you know, responding to that and so on guarantees that more people will see it and that it will be promoted because the social media things just want eyes on this stuff. They don't care what the content is. And so if you said you're wrong, you helped to, to get more people to see this stupid person doing these stupid things. It does not work. We need to create conditions in which people can get together, can eat together, can listen to each other. And that's what we're working on under a variety of efforts of that sort. And if you really want to pursue that, let me know. I'm happy to help. So we're no, we won't know what your values are. And, but th this is the uh, brief look at psychological flexibility. Um, if you said these were your aspirations, then we might ask you, well, what kinds of thoughts and feelings move you away from pursuing those aspirations? What kinds of behaviors might you engage in? You know, oh, people will never listen and I'm just going to, you know, watch football instead. Don't get me wrong. I watch a lot of football, but uh, it's a guilty pleasure. Um, but asking people to, to notice the thoughts and feelings that they have, but then think about the specific things that they might do to make a difference. That's the essence of psychological flexibility and that's what we need and so so what uh values to action has developed over the last two years is, is action circles and we see that as one strategy for nurturing communities our proposition is that if you're not satisfied with the state of your community action circles give you an opportunity to do something about it they consist of a small group of people who come together to advance a very specific improvement in the community by being time limited, they give you a way to contribute to change that doesn't require you to quit your job, your education, your family, or your recreation. We need a social movement in this country, not unlike the social movement of the progressive movement of the first half of the 20th century that massively increased uh, the well-being of the population. Robert, Robert Putnam has another book called Upswing who talks about how people came together to support each other in the first half of the 20th century, and then it began to decline as, I, as I've already shown you. So uh, 
you know, it's, it, we need to activate people, many more people, not just, you know, a few activists. And so what we're trying to do is find, here's a small amount of time you could put into this and maybe you can make a difference. So some of the action circles we've already developed are, um, okay, um, I'm gonna skip that. Uh, action circles, we have one on increasing the use of evidence-based social emotional learning, like the PACS Good Behavior Game or Cooperative Learning. And we're working in communities around the country to get these programs adopted. Uh, we have one on increasing effective reading instruction. Um, there's probably very few communities where more than 65% of white kids are proficient in reading at fourth grade level. And if you cannot read by fourth grade, you're not like you're unlikely to ever become a, a, a successful reader. So 65 is really not good enough. We need more white kids, right? But the proficiency level of Native American and Black kids uh, is, is way lower, and, uh, and Hispanic kids is way lower than that, right? We are sentencing those kids to academic failure and all of the things that follow be, by allowing this to happen. And it's happening in, in communities all over the country. It's happening in Eugene, Oregon, where I come from, where uh, we are failing to deal with these proficiency problems, despite the fact that Eugene, Oregon is one of the number one places on educational research that has shown effective ways of getting kids to learn to read. And so we're working with communities around the country on reducing reading disparities. And we have a good way of doing that, which I probably don't have time to go into. We're increasing the availability of behaviorally skilled personnel in healthcare because kids with developmental disabilities don't get good health care because a kid with autism, you try and do a, 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 an assessment of them, they may be freak out and people don't know how to deal with it. So they just don't get the good care. But there are behavioral specialists all over the country who have the skills to do this. So we wrote a guide to why those people should be in hospitals and clinics so that they're available so that uh, kids with the developmental dis disabilities get what they need. We wrote a guide to reforming juvenile justice in communities. And we're working on regulating harmful marketing. We have a paper summarizing that and the need for policies on that. And we're increasing pro-social norms and behaviors in communities and trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So action circles, eight to 12 people, a clear goal, a clear goal that can be achieved in two months. And the proposition is we'd ask you to volunteer an hour or two a week for eight weeks. And we'll meet every two weeks. And everybody has an assignment. So if you're if you're an academic, I like to always point out to academics, you know, you're on a committee, right? If you're an academic, right? And you really hate being on those committees. I mean, every academic I've known, right? And so what do these committees work? Well, they have a meeting and somebody takes minutes. And then at the next meeting, somebody reads those minutes and then they talk about something else and they probably argue about, I can remember at the University of Oregon, I was there, there was uh, money and should the faculty members get that to go to conferences or should we let the graduate students have some? Guess where the money went, right? But, you know, but everybody's fighting about it at the same time. Unlike a committee, an action circle comes together around a shared value and a, a shared goal and works to try and achieve that goal. And by achieving that goal, you, you've created a brick that becomes part of the foundation for the next steps. And so this is, you know, let's take one step. And when you're done with that, uh, you can take another step. You tell me a problem and I'll tell you how you can use action circles to, to solve that problem. So here's our approach to communities. First of all, we do community visioning. Then we, get a, we create an action circle that's organizing uh, everything else to happen. What do they do? This action circle will work on how we promote community values, norms, and behavior, and it'll identify community change priorities via careful listening, because we need to listen to the people in the community. So it's not just the eight or 10 people in the action circle who decide what the problems are. They simply say, we think these are the problems. Now let's go out to the community and get as many people as possible to participate in saying, what are the things that we want to make a difference on? And then uh, organize action circles to address top priorities. 
So expanding on what the, the action circle does to promote community values and norms is reward and praise and recognition by a social media, but also art and community events are all useful. We also think we need to promote psychological flexibility because it's almost invariable that if you help someone in a clinical setting to become more psychologically flex flexible, the first thing we do is we ask them, what is really important to you? What do you want your life to be about? And how can you make that something that, that informs your life every day? Because that makes your life more meaningful. And if you can do that, uh, you know, things will move forward. So we're interested in how we can promote psychological flexibility in communities. So, um, and then there's, th this is uh, in virtually all the communities we've talked to so far are saying that their concerns about youth development uh, is a major factor. And, you know, you look at the broken windows in Portland, Oregon, you say, yeah, the youth are kind of out of control, right? So what do we do? Well, th this, um, if, if an action circle said, yes, we want to promote development of youth, uh, we might create action circles to deal with each of these things. These are a number of, all of these are evidence-based approaches to improving outcomes for youth, preventing reading failure, the PACS Good Behavior Game, cooperative learning in middle schools. Cooperative learning is where kids work together in a small group and they learn to cooperate and they do better than the kids who are doing worse in classes uh, in learning, do better in learning in these cooperative things. It doesn't undermine the learning of the, the you know, kids are ahead, but it also increases the degree to which everybody feels uh, uh, appreciated and cared for and make friends across these you know, barriers that often exist. Um, meaningful roles and activities for youth, significant benefit, reduce access to alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, reform juvenile justice, and you name it, I think we can do it. Uh, and this, I think, is my last slide, other than my advertising values to action. I'm going to advertise that in a minute. But um, this, is, this is basically what we know about uh, youth problem development. Families that are high in conflict have poor family involvement. And, and we did, a, this is a study we did 20 years ago. Uh, these families that have poor family involvement and family conflict don't monitor their kids. This is a, we, this is a year later, we asked them and they weren't monitoring their kids. If you uh, have a kid who doesn't really who resists what you want to do and there's a lot of conflict and it's not working and so on, eventually you just stop, you know, uh, you know, I didn't want you to be with that kid. Ah, shut up, you know. Well, you're not, you're not monitoring them. You're not preventing them from getting involved in deviant peer groups. And so that leads to association with deviant peers and that leads to all of these different problem behaviors. All these problem behaviors are interrelated. So you know, you can't just work at one of these. We need to deal with all of them. So this is basically um, what we know about this. And we have multiple family and school interventions that have proven benefit in preventing these kinds of problems. So we can prevent the... the I was on a National Academy of Science uh, committee uh, summarizing what we've learned about prevention. And the conclusion we reached was that we have the knowledge, if we could use it, if we could actually use it in communities to ensure that virtually every young person arrives at adulthood with the skills, interests, values, and health habits they need to lead a productive life and caring relationships with other people. And that is the mantra that has been driving me to write the nurture effect and to remain working uh, even though I'm supposed to be retired because I'm so old. And so, um, for more information, you can go to valuestoaction.org. And if you're into QR codes, you can go there and you can join Values to Action for only $47. Use a lifetime membership in Values to Action. Uh, here's, a, here's a satisfied customer. Uh, and we, uh, we need the money. If, if I, I, uh, I, 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 uh, Capitalism has been very good to me. And um, I take $5,000 a month out of my retirement and fund values to action for that. We're 
trying to get get more money, but we're in fundraising mode these days because we need more. If I had another hundred thousand dollars, I would create some action circles that I know could make a difference that would design what can be done in a community to deal with homelessness, uh, to deal with, you know, you actually, I'll shut up and you can tell me what problems you want to discuss. Um, so, and these are additional references and I think that's it. So, but please join us and or donate. And I'm, I'm still waiting for the billionaire and one of my audiences to come up and say, Tony, I really want to help you do this because we would do it in more and more communities. What I'm looking for is somebody who's willing to, to put out a, a, a request for proposals to communities and say, if you feel, you know, if you can convince us that you're prepared to, to follow this approach, we will help you do this. And we're already in the process of advertising to people all over the country. And we're working we're working on re reducing reading failure in uh, South Carolina, uh, and uh, we're going to do it in the African, the African American community. Uh, if, if, so when I when you invited me up here, and I'm I, I've been working with this guy on Zoom for I don't know a year, right? And to, yeah, and we've never actually met, right? So I go. Hey, we're gonna come, I'm gonna do this live. And I just spent yesterday talking to Vincent and we're we're excited, but we need more money. So donate money. And on that note, no, I think I'll stop talking and I broke your device. So Dr. Biglin, thank you so much for a thorough and moving con conversation today and your work and values to action. Thank you. So Dr. Biglin, uh, my question is. For an audience like ours, um, values to action relates very well to humanism, but let's say you gave it to a mega church or a deeply conservative community, how different does their collage of values look than what you put up on the screen earlier? Um, you know, uh, uh, Tommy Ashby is the, the uh, our managing director who does a lot of the work and values to action. And one of the things he was doing was when somebody would put, what do you want to see here, feel and do more for the Newberg effort? We also asked them, what do you want to see, fear, hear and feel less of, right? Which we do the kids. We didn't make a word cloud of that, right? So Tommy emails me and he says, this one guy fills this out and he put all these positive values, right? When he said what he didn't want, he says, I don't want any see more of that, any more of that Black Lives Matter crap, right? And Tommy was like, oh, you know, this is, you know. I said, wait a minute, this guy's saying the positive kinds of things. We need to join each other around the positive kinds of things. And so I, I actually told this story at uh, uh, Denise's uh, celebration of life so she's died. I'm flying to South Carolina. And uh, this is like two weeks ago. And this guy gets on and he sits next to me and he starts chatting with me. I don't really talk much to people. And, and he, he tells me that hey, we're talking a little bit. And I mentioned climate change. And he says, oh, Democrat. Right. <laughs> and I'm going, Denise, you must be watching. Can I listen to this man? And, you know, I mean, as she would do, right? And so I proceeded to talk to him and, li and listen to him and, 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 and in a cordial way. And I found out that he believes that um, he can help and has helped gay people by getting the demons out of them, right? And he's brought people back from the death that a, that a bap he's from Wyoming, by the way. And, and there's a Baptist church that said they didn't want any more of them. I mean, you know, this guy's, you know, all right. So I, you know, my job, Denise, is just to listen to this man and respectfully. And so he also told me that um, he had helped uh, on the, the uh, census and that he went to a reservation to work on that because he realized that if they undercounted, it would undermine, you know, the benefits that would come to the community. He wanted to have those benefits. And then I said, well, you have any kids? And he said he had three kids. He said, one of them is a veterinarian. I said, 
oh, my daughter uh, uh, trains dogs for a living. She has a company in Eugene called Training Spot. Get it? Training Spot? <laughs> Took me a while, right? But I, but I was like 30 years before I realized the Beatles was, oh, B-E-A-T. Oh, I get it. You know. So uh, he, so, and then he gave me a book, which I've actually started reading. And, and then he emailed me because he wanted a copy of my book. And I'm going, what, what struck me was that I, there, there was the common humanity. I said, you know, my daughter trains dogs and he says, he's, he says, well, I have seven dogs and I love them. I said, my wife and I are more cat people. He says, oh, I have a cat who just died after 19 years. Oh, you know, I mean, it was just common humanity, right? And that's where we need to reach people. So a long answer to a short question. All right, we're going to Joyce live at the Friendly House. I'm fascinated by the various suggestions you're making. And I'm wondering, could you give us a specific action? You mentioned the actions that would, would be part of the solution for these various problems. What's a specific action parents might take with that child who is not listening and is who already involved with a number of groups that you don't want him involved with? Well, you know, I'm on the uh, Drug and Alcohol Commission for the state of Oregon, and I'm chair of the prevention subcommittee. And so that led me to get clear on what family programs are available in this state. And I was pleased to find out that there are about six different evidence-based family interventions that are ma being made available throughout the state of Oregon. Unfortunately, they're reaching far too few families, but there are a number of foundations and the state that are trying to expand that. All of these family interventions have in common that they help parents abandon coercive ways of harsh and inconsistent discipline and adopt much more nurturing ways of interacting with their kids. And so, um, if you've got a kid who's out of control, I could point you to a family intervention. I, I mean, it's just my grandson who's 12 years old. When he was about four, he could have a screech when he wasn't happy that was just really not pleasant, right? And this is the sweetest kid. And you know, his parents got some help from a, a, a family therapist in helping to set some limits. No, no, we don't want you to do this. We want you to do that. Lots of positive reinforcement for the things that he was doing properly and not screaming and yelling at him when he didn't, but no, that's stuff we don't want you to do and having some consequences for that. Um, he, he, they, the school was concerned. Uh, he was hugging people too much, but I mean, you can't get out of the house without getting a hug from this boy, so. <laughs> okay, so maybe what you're saying is simply more attention, positive attention. Let's have a family conference seven o'clock every evening or something positive yes. where you're, yes. you're responding to this kid in a different way. Well, and in fact, my colleague who developed the PACS Good Behavior Game has also developed PACS tools for parents. And that's the first thing you do is a visioning. What if this were the most wonderful family you could be in, what would you see for you? feel, do more of. And then that goes with uh, a, a lot of rewards as well, you know, positive reinforcement, uh, but not stickers and so Thank on. You. But yeah. So it, 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 we can do this. We can do it. We need to do more of it. So. Thank you. Let's go to Ann at the Friendly House. Um, what I'd really like to hear is um, what's a community? How many, how big, how big is the community? Is my Pheasant Drive uh, Condominium Association or something like that? I don't have a condominium, but you know, something along those lines. Right. Is that a community or is, is your block a community? Uh, you know, is your, is Portland a community? Uh, that's uh, too big uh, to me. <laughs> well, it, it, it probably is. Um, that's a good question. I, I, I think I'm, uh, some people from Oakland said they want help with reforming juvenile justice. And I was going, gee. Oakland, uh, Oregon? Please. No, no. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, but in fact, we need to start with the smaller groups and build up from there. Um, so yeah, if uh, the city of Portland said they wanted to do, well, I mean, we're, we're talking about the, the uh, uh, well, the African refugee community, let's say, 
we are. consider that a community, but they're spread around. They're not in one place. So it's not a physical thing. I see. But you can create a community through social media, right? So what we're hoping to do is bring people together around a shared vision and promote that vision, but then start to help with families, the kind of intervent, the kind of family programs you talked about. Um, but you know, I'm open to I'm open to trying this in, in a variety of ways. I, I was consulting with Sweden. And by the way, the action circles come from the concept of the study circles, which is a Swedish okay. thing, right? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm now consulting to them about how they can create action circles to deal with the high, they have a, uh, at least one neighborhood, you won't believe it, but Sweden has one neighborhood that has all these same problems. Yeah. So yes, yes, <laughs> it's, uh, it's everywhere. So it's a good question, and, and we we don't know we don't exactly. Know, so it, it, it all depends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what you, I mean, what you do in a place like uh, Portland uh, is you, I, you could do this, but then uh, you know, community wide. But then you could identify neighborhoods that want to actually do something in their neighborhood, and help them, and you create an action circle down to the level of a neighborhood. And in fact. Yes, and in fact, I'm involved. Um, you know where the White House is? It's uh, uh, bed and breakfast, White House? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. My wife grew up in the fourplex that's across the street from that, and she still owns that fourplex. And we're actually dealing with people not getting along there. So everywhere I turn, it's the same thing, trying to get people to... Let's stay at the friendly house for a question from Preston. Like, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I appreciate the action circles, but it seems we fundamentally have the problem with income distribution. Yes. So, uh, and are we are we going to try to do anything about that at this in this world? I mean, I grew up when I first got out of college and a first decent paying job. I remember an incremental income tax of about fifty percent. It just shocked me, but that's how we work. So do right. we ever get back there? Does that happen all through the 50s and 60s? We had those kind of incremental taxes. I, I, we, I, you know, I showed in that one diagram, we have to change public policy, right? How do we do that? I think that we have to do it by having people come together around shared vision and values but then you have to chip away at this, just as the Republicans, the conservatives have chipped away at it for 50 years. This is, you know, Lewis Powell had a, a, a phrase in his memos over an indefinite period of time. And that is what we need. Our, you know, I mean, I will be dead before this problem is solved, but we need to organize people to work, to actually take action on these things over an indefinite period of time. So um, you might look at the city of Portland and the disparities that exist in the, in the community and identify policies that have been shown to make a difference in terms of increasing uh, economic well-being. And, it, and in fact, if you, if you said, you want me to create an action circle to work on that, I would bring together people like the people in Echo Northwest and other policymakers and so on, because there are better and worse policies. So the first thing you do is look at what are the policies that work the best, and then how can you get those implemented? And there are a whole bunch of them, but but people aren't you know paying attention to this. If I had a, uh, in fact, if I had a hundred thousand dollars, one of the things I mean, if you give me the hundred thousand dollars because you want this action circle on this question, then we will put together people who can figure out what are the what what do we know about policies that work. And as we do that, if we do it in this community and we show that it worked and we showed that there's less homelessness and you're beginning to solve these problems. We're networked with all these other groups and all these other communities, and we can get better and better at this. So I mean, that was, I think, just as Vincent was, I was we walking to his car yesterday, I thought we just like, oh, we can network people. This worked here. It can work there. But we all, you know, I mean, that, that's what the, the conservatives did. You know, oh, this worked here. Whoa, well, let's do it. You know, we can do the same thing. It's an evolutionary process. And thanks for asking. Friendly House dominating our questions today. We have a question from Vincent in the last row at the Friendly House. Uh-oh. 
just gonna add to what Tony was talking to to us today, because I'm also a member of the Value to Action and I worked with Tony for the past two years. I was so pleased to see him in Poland. So for the past three days, he had been he and I have been hanging out together. So I'm gonna respond to the community uh, framework. Someone asked a question: What's the community? Yes. The people you live with in your condominium, they are your community if you have a shared vision or shared value together. And then those small communities can network together to bring to about a big, a large, big community. Myself, I identify myself as a member of the African refugee community. But if you ask me who are the members, I have no idea. But if you ask me, do you meet? Yes, we do meet. How big is the community? I don't know because I don't have the names of every refugee every refugee member who is reseller in Oregon. But I feel like I'm a member of that group because we have a shared vision and the shared values that we are having advocating for. And one of them is pro-social behavior for our kids. They come here at age 15. What does the American education system do to them? Put them in high school, they have never been in school. So reading a uh, failure, they are one of them, right? And then when they graduate by age 18, they can't go to college because they don't have limited resources or maybe skills to navigate the courses at universities. So as you can tell, we are creating a second uh, generation or maybe second class series, and I can say. So, so what does that tell us as refugees who came here and who are liberal. I'm successful, I have a PhD, so I have no idea how I did it. But what do I, should I just sit down and say, hey, I'm good when I know my community is still suffering out there? No. And that's how I found Tony with this value to action. And I was, oh, this is great because I know we can develop a sense of community with a shared vision and that vision can influence policies. Do you remember this? There is a slide that Tony shared, and the policies were here at the beginning, but he didn't even show it. He showed that after he showed the social determinant of health and everything. So policies are the first one that can influence those social determinant of health to get better outcome in health. I just finished the study. I'm part of the family checkup. I'm not sure if you have heard of it. I'm part of the research group of, of, on that. Uh, they have been doing this research for the past 17 years now. So we have been following these kids since they were two years old. Now they are 20 years old. Today they are and, 20 and years this old. This is one of the major family interventions right. developed here in Oregon where has very good results. Right. It was developed at Oregon, in Oregon and I'm so pleased to be there. So my second paper writing for them, we just did the analysis last week and this is what we found. So we followed these kids when they were two years old and we looked at the mothers who were financially stressed, right? So we followed those mothers, sorry, the kids with those mothers. How am I explaining this? No. So the kids are two years to four years old, right? Mothers are expecting that they're financially stressed, right? The kids are seven and eight years old. Mothers are displaying negative parenting skills. Those kids are 14. They are displaying that in school teachers are seeing they have deviant behaviors at age 14. At age 16, guess what happened there? They are smoking already. Age 19, they are already extensively smoking and low education attainment. They didn't do anything wrong. It's because we didn't take care of their, their mothers when they were younger. And the bad news is the family checkup, which is an effective family intervention, did not do anything. Most of the time, the family checkup, when it's plugged in, it will reduce the harm of the, you know, like depression for mothers, deviant behavior for the kids, because it, of course we follow them, right? But the family checkup did not do anything. And do you know why? Because we neglect the mothers when they were, they were just when they gave birth. And that's because this country does not take care of poor people. Thank you, Vincent, for that example. We need to get to some other questions and thank you for your work with Values to Action. Let's go to Sharon at the Friendly House with a question. Oh, am I? You are. We got you. I can be heard? I can. Yep. Okay. Uh, we can arrange a meeting for you right here in Friendly House if you would like. 
for a circle. And you can teach us how. In fact, I would like to know very much, even how to write a book like you do. <laughs> but uh, um, it can be done for free whenever you choose. Now, I would suggest maybe Friday, because we're elderly, <laughs> and we could do it at the end. We're going to wrap up questions with a couple of questions from our Zoom audience. Let's go to Al. Yes, question is, do you, do you have any idea about who's working against you in this kind of thing? If you just look at Portland, you see a process going on here that's been going on for ages of neighborhoods going to hell and then real estate developers getting rich by tearing them down, gentrifying them, forcing everybody out to go someplace else. And, that, and then when that neighborhood goes downhill, they repeat the process and get rich again at the next place and the next place. I'm not sure if that's some kind of organic economic process or if it's a conspiracy. I could well be either one, but I, there's a I, chance I that if you got too good at this, you're going to run up into some pretty, uh, run up against some pretty powerful forces who are much more well funded than you, who, who really don't want you to succeed. Well, you know, it, it's interesting you say that. I, I, uh, I'm connected with a network of people who believe, as I do, behavioral scientists, uh, the, the developer of the acceptance and commitment stuff, the psychological flexibility, a uh, very well-known evolutionary scientist, David Sloan Wilson, Dennis Embry, who the PACS Good Behavior Game. And we're all in one way or another trying to promote nurturance and so on. And... Um, I get up every morning and read the headlines in the New York Times and the Washington Post, and I'm not optimistic, quite frankly, about the future, uh, re realistically. But my values are that, you know, I should work on these things. Uh, I'd love it if uh, somebody came after me because I was deemed as a threat to the kind of thing that you're talking about. Uh, and. Uh, but but what is it? I, I don't think that there's a conspiracy in the sense, uh, well, it, it's just they're all connected with, hey, I made a lot of money last year. I made a fortune. I, I, I keep thinking about this, this uh, I don't know, 30 something that bought one of the drug companies and he had this drug and he raised it, you know, and he was outraged that people thought that was something wrong because he's making a lot of money. He must be doing good. It's not the case but it's that value that we need to keep uh, pushing. And so um, maybe there's a neighborhood that's gonna be gentrified and the people are gonna make a bunch of money where if the people were organized in that community uh, that they could push back against that. But we need, we need to build that you know, one action circle at a time. I think an action circle, I mean, you know, Saul Alinsky, community organizing can make a difference, but we need to organize people to do it. So that's not a particularly satisfying answer, but. Yeah, um, you can see the pictures of Lair Hill, you know, when that, before that was redeveloped, there were lots of people down there putting up signs and protesting that oh, we didn't want the redevelopment project coming through, but they're gone and the high rises are there. Yep. Final question from our Zoom community from Jules. Jules, come on in. I just want to acknowledge your commitment to a life's work that continues on even to today to improving the lot of humanity. My comment is of a personal nature. I'm first generation. Mother came from Greece. Father came from Turkey. Grade school education. Uh, college was not even a word that showed up in my house. Trade school, yes, learn a trade, get married, move a block away, and we'll eat together. I was angry. I got into trouble in school. My brothers would go up because my mother couldn't get away to talk to the principal or the teacher. And long and short of it is, my mother said to me one day, look, you can't do anything that would damage your father's good name. You can't do anything to insult a teacher or a rabbi. You have to change that. And she never condemned me. What I'm saying is the mother's role and in the black 
community, the grandmother's role is so crucial to the success of an individual who's deviant in behavior to go forward and say, you know, there is a way to go. My, the good end of my story is I got, I joined the army and Korean war and I got the GI bill and you know, like you, I got the benefits of capitalism, GI mortgage. And I got the advanced degrees and I wrote the books and I've had the great life. Okay, so Jules, get your, get your question here. Okay, so the end of the day is what can we do to improve the lot of the mother? Because you did mention in one of your slides, Social Security and Medicare took the over 65 group, age group out of the poverty yes. uh, threat as much as that is changing even now. So where is rent control? Where is uh, unions? You know, we had unions to protect the worker. In other words, the mother is still a vulnerable entity. The yeah. mother is not given the opportunity to mother because of the shortchanging of her economic well-being. Well, the economic well-being is, is hugely the issue. Um, and... Um, you know, there's clear evidence that the earned income tax credit improves the economic well-being of families. And we just had an we just had an experiment in the last two years because uh, one of the bills that the Biden administration passed put a significant amount of money in the hands of poor families, but it then it expired, right? So that's what we call an experiment. We had poverty. Oh, income, and then going down. And I guarantee you that somebody is doing research on that, and I'm sure it will show. I mean, it, I was talking to somebody just the other day who's working on child abuse and neglect, and it's very clear that economic well-being of families, and it's what Vincent was saying, is, is a protective factor. It, it reduces the likelihood that there will be problems. So yes. any economic policies that improve the economic well-being of poor families are to the good. You're an income tax credit. What the Biden administration did, um, but we need we need to get people elected who do those things. Thank you so much for your presentation today. As you can see, you've inspired dialogue this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.